I do research in an area called social neuroscience. Um, those two terms often uh, strike people as an oxymoron. I mean, what could social and neuroscience have to do with one another? But in fact, uh, we're fundamentally a social species. And social species, by definition, create emergent organizations, superorganismal structures. That means dyads, pairs, families, villages, institutions, cultures. Uh, and those structures have evolved hand in hand with neural, hormonal, cellular, genetic mechanisms because those structures help us survive, reproduce, and care for our offspring long enough so that they too can reproduce, therefore ensuring genetic legacy. What we do in social neuroscience is look at the brain as if it were an internet device. So you look at it and you say, where's the Wi-Fi card? Now, what is communication? Well, that's, that's a means of speaking to other people and or signaling other people so that you can work together, so that you have uh, a team that can accomplish something rather than an individual. One way to study what does that social environment, what do those configurations do to brain and biology, uh, is to look at what happens when it's absent. And that's the study of social isolation. So I've spent a good deal of time over the last couple of decades studying social isolation and perceived isolation. Perceived isolation has another name that people use, and it's loneliness. And so we've spent a lot of time looking at loneliness and how that impacts the brain and how that impacts biology. And we have found that it affects, for instance, not only what the brain is doing and how the brain perceives the rest of the environment, but it also affects uh, how you sleep because the brain remains on alert when you feel isolated and it affects which genes are turned on and off. So it has a very broad and powerful effect, much broader than was appreciated when we first started studying this. What sparked my interest in studying social isolation as a factor per se was a science article published in 1988 that showed social isolation predicted broad-based morbidity and mortality. Simply said, people who were uh, alone uh, died earlier. Uh, and that struck me as a, a, a way, to, a lens through which to look at how social factors were impacting the brain and biology. I did not anticipate it to be such a powerful lens at that point in time. It's turned out uh, that it's not objective isolation, it's perceived isolation. It, you can be in a crowd. If that crowd turns out to be antagonistic, um, that's more dangerous than if you're alone. So it's this perceived isolation that's really powerful. We find many of the same cognitive and biologic effects in humans as we find in animals. If you take a rat and you isolate it, uh, and you put it in an open field, basically just put it on the ground, it will walk around the outside, uh, staying close to exits because it feels threatened. It's isolated, it feels threatened. Humans, similarly, their brain goes on alert for threats, social threats in particular, and even when they fall asleep, their brain remains hyper alert, and so they show more micro awakenings during the night. We've even studied that in the same people over time. When you feel lonely, that night, you will show more micro-awakenings on average than when you feel uh, fully connected to other individuals. Objective isolation and perceived isolation are really quite different in humans. Now, if you study non-human animals, um, you, it, it, you can take a mouse and house it by itself, isolated mouse, house it with cage mates, group house, uh, and those mice are going to show very strong differences in, for instance, how big uh, a stroke that you artificially make in the brain of that mouse will become. That isolated mouse, which is genetically identical to the group house mouse, will show three times larger uh, wound from the same experimental stroke manipulation. And it's because of uh, inflammation that is activated by this feeling of isolation. Right? Now in humans, we don't want to take them and isolate them for long periods to see the effects of isolation on their brain and biology because it would have very negative consequences, including early mortality. So we can't do that. When we do experimentally manipulate felt loneliness or isolation, we do it for a short period of time. We manipulate, hypnotize them, make them feel lonely, have them fill out scales or do some task, and then reverse the effect. We have found the objective isolation and the perceived isolation when people are selecting into circumstances to be very different. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there are some predictors of whether you feel isolated, whether you're married. On average, people who are married feel less lonely. Uh, frequency of contact with friends and family, the greater that frequency, on average, the less lonely you feel.
and uh, your collective identity, whether you have an important um, social identity. In Britain, for instance, uh, in, with, when the Olympics were in London, uh, and the Brits were winning uh, medals. If you recall the London Olympics, they didn't win medals the first few days and people worried. Then they started winning medals. Uh, people in Britain started to come together. Strangers were hugging one another. There was this sense of identity as a Brit. All three of those were associated with feeling less lonely. But some people in marriages feel estranged from their spouse. And that is a particularly isolating feeling when you have that experience. When you have contact with family, but that contact is negative, um, it can be particularly isolating. Uh, these holidays uh, that people enjoy, Thanksgiving uh, uh, is a case in point, uh, you're supposed to enjoy that safe social surround with friends and family. When you're there, but you don't have that feeling of connection, it's particularly isolating. So you see the objective isolation and the subjective can vary quite dramatically, and when it does, it's particularly painful. One of the things that uh, sustained my interest in social isolation are the, the many different effects it has had. One of the early studies we did, once we realized it was perceived isolation, not objective isolation in humans, we, we experimentally manipulated isolation. Uh, that is the perception of isolation. Uh, and the reason we did that study was because uh, I might be studying whether you feel isolated, whether you feel lonely. But th that is a feature that doesn't travel by itself. People who feel isolated or feel lonely also uh, are, tend to feel shyer. They, they have poor social skills. Uh, they feel uh, sadder, a little more depressed. Uh, they feel more hostile, they're more negative toward others, and they're in more negative mood. So they have a whole set of factors that vary with uh, feeling isolated or lonely. And one wants to know, well, how important is the loneliness and to what extent is it just they're being depressed or they're being shy or they're having poor social skills? So we experimentally manipulated whether people felt lonely or not. And in fact, we did this in the same individuals, right? So we made a group feel lonely and then we made them feel very connected or vice versa so that order wasn't a, uh, an important factor. Uh, and we did this using hypnosis. And we used in the study participants who had been in another study uh, done at Stanford uh, that Dave Spiegel and Steve Cawson had published showing that hypnotic inductions led these individuals to actually show brain activation in a region responsible for color vision when they were told they were looking at a color image, whether or not they were. Whereas the low hypnotizables, that region was activated depending on whether they looked at a color image, not whether they were told they were looking at a color image. So that's, that's the best evidence I've ever seen for hypnosis. So we flew out to Stanford. David did the hypnotic induction using our, our procedures for manipulating loneliness. And these individuals were made to feel lonely or not lonely. They then filled out the surveys that we had found to differentiate lonely and non-lonely people. And we had a couple scales in there that didn't differentiate because if it were just people saying, you know, you told me I felt lonely, so I'm going to look sad and hostile and all these things, then they would differ on those questions as well. And what we found was really stunning. If I make you feel lonely, you become more depressed. You become shyer. Your social skills are poor. And we now have brain imaging work is to say why you actually develop poor social skills when you feel lonely. Uh, you feel more hostile. You're angrier toward others. Your mood goes down. You fear negative evaluation. So all these things that we worried about being confounding factors turned out to be consequences. Our research continues to evolve in the area of social isolation. Um, one of the areas of research we've begun and uh, happily are funded uh, through 2020 is to look at isolation in uh, non-human primates as well as humans. We're working with John Capitanio and Steve Cole out in California. Uh, in the National California Primate Center. Uh, they have rhesus monkeys and we're able to uh, look at those monkeys from the perspective of whether they feel isolated and whether they are isolated. You can do experiments where you can isolate them for 30 days and look at the biological effects, something that we would be remiss to do in humans, but uh, we can do safely and not to the long-term detriment of the animals uh, at the National uh, Primate Center. And we're looking at the molecular mechanisms. Uh, I, I mentioned that the brain is signaling the, the genes, turning them on and off. Uh, we have very good information about what those pathways might be. And working with the animals, we can now do the more specific molecular studies that are necessary to 
to uh, make certain that those uh, hunches are empirically tested and, and refined. Interventions uh, is something that we're moving in just because it is such an important problem. The effect of isolation on mortality is four times larger than obesity and it's more prevalent. So when you think about obesity as a major health problem, think about felt isolation having four times the impact on your health as obesity. So that's why countries are now seeing this as a, as a significant health problem and it's brought to our table. Well, okay, you've shown that it has negative effects. What do you do about it? How can you help ameliorate or cure uh, this? And so we're, we're, we've turned our attention to that. And that's something I hope that we can, we can make significant progress over the next uh, uh, decade or so as well.